is a, 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 a works with the NGS, as we said on an introductory slide. Um, and the subject matter he's going to be covering is something that we all need to be aware of. Um, there was some question as to Jadan's availability, just given the, the some of the uncertainty in, in uh, government shutdowns. We're glad that they got through that and Dan is able to join us. Um, um, quick intro to Dan. Uh, uh, he's Northeast Regional uh, uh, Geodetic Advisor at NGS. In this role, he instructs local surveyors, state and municipal agencies, and the geospatial community at large on how to use pre and preserve the national geospatial reference system. Provides liaison between the NGS and the states um, of new, all the New England states, plus it looks like New York and New Jersey. So basically, if you're looking at the map of the US, it's everything up in the, the northeast corner uh, is under his charge, as well as other financial uh, federal agencies as well. He worked on the, the route survey and geodetic survey sections of the Vermont Agency of Transportation from 1988 to 2003 and held the position of geodetic program supervisor for the agency from 1999 to 2003. In 2003, Mr. Martin began his career with the NGS at the Vermont State Geod as, as the Vermont State Geodetic Advisor. He is a past president and fellow member of the American Association for Geodetic Surveying and is also a member of the Vermont Society of Land Surveyors and the New Hampshire uh, Land Surveyors Association. And once again, we are delighted uh, to have Dan with us today uh, to introduce us to uh, the coming changes that we should be aware of in 2022. Dan, are we connecting with you today? Uh, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you loud and clear. Excellent. So we're going to switch our screens here and you can take it away. Great, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, to talk with you folks um, about something that's very near and dear to my heart, uh, which is uh, uh, the uh, announcement of, of new reference frames that will be coming in, in 2022 for, um, for the United States. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in here. There we go. Uh, this is sort of what we want to look to cover today, and um, please understand, I mean, this is about a 40, 45 minute presentation, and uh, uh, the topics that we're going to just just scratch the surface of today can certainly be discussed in whole in a, in a full day workshop, um, so uh, hopefully I'll whet your appetite, and uh, there'll be plenty of questions and the opportunity for folks to dig into this more, um, more on their own after the fact. As was uh, was mentioned, I'm the, the uh, advisor for the Northeast region. Uh, for those from the states online, uh, please be aware, hopefully you're all aware, that there are advisors um, throughout the country, uh, including the Pacific and Alaska. Uh, so if you're not familiar with your geodetic advisor within your region, um, this information can be found on the NGS website. Just wanted to, uh, to provide that for you folks for information purposes. So the, the National Spatial Reference System, um, you know, what is it? Um, essentially, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's those quantities that we use for mapping on a regular basis, latitude, longitude, and height. And, uh, height. Um, in addition to that, we have other uh, under, under, uh, underlying quantities, um, gravity, scale, orientation, help us define our system. But as time has moved on, uh, we realize, and probably most folks on the line realize, that, that we don't live in a static world. So it's not just these quantities in whole, it's how these quantities, uh, it also includes how these quantities change over time. Uh, we don't live in, 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 a, in a static world. Uh, we live in a very dynamic world, some places more dynamic than others. But, but there is no place on Earth that you can certainly can say that, that where you are today, you guaranteed will be in the same location tomorrow. So just a quick primer on, on datums, um, you know, we, we refer right, wrong, or otherwise to NAG83 as, as our horizontal datum. In reality, uh, today it's a geometric datum. It includes uh, the third component, the ellipsoid heights, so latitude, longitude, and ellipsoid heights. And really the, the last horizontal datum we had was the original realization of NAG83, which is NAG386, um, and of course NAG27 prior to that. And we currently still <clears throat> use a, a one-dimensional datum for our heights, whether that be NAD83, I'm sorry, NAVD88 for orthometric heights um, or local title datums, et cetera. And essentially, that's our one-dimensional one uh, vertical datum. 
And today, um, especially if folks who are working in the international frames, whether it be uh, the International Terrestrial Reference Frame or a WGS-84 type system, we're obviously having to deal with the fourth component, which is time and the fact that in, in a global scale, uh, the, the continents are moving. Uh, so, you know, uh, with continental drift, everything is is moving relative to the Earth's center mass, which is um, for today's coordinate systems the origin. So, the uh, the origin three dimensional Cartesian zero 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 at the Earth's center of mass. So, a very really really quick brief history of um, of NAD eighty three uh, originally realized in nineteen eighty six consisted almost entirely of classical observations. There was a little bit of of Doppler. Which, uh, which helped to uh, control scale across the country. But essentially, it was line of sight type observations. <clears throat> uh, in the 90s, primarily, we started with the use of, of GPS. Um, and out of that came uh, the high precision genetic networks or the high accuracy reference networks, uh, as they're most commonly referred to. Um, but all of our classical observations were also um, connected back to these uh, these HARN marks or high accuracy reference network marks, um, and those classical observations were adjusted to the GPS work across the country. <clears throat> In 2007, we had a readjustment of the National Spatial Reference System. So, for the first time ever, we really had a, a nationwide simultaneous adjustment uh, of all GPS data. Um, this adjustment did not include the old classical networks and it was GPS uh, GPS work only and then in 2000 um, in 2011 we had yet another readjustment of NAG83 um, and this was essentially to uh, to readjust uh, the terrestrial net or the um, the the passive network meaning the, the marks in the ground um, to the national cores network or uh, to the new coordinates for the National Cores Network. So <clears throat> other than the fact that we can, why, why have we changed datums um, or realizations of datums over time? Um, historically, in the earlier days, again, all of the observations were, were really were based on uh, you know, line of sight type triangulation, trilateration, high, uh, high order traverse work. Um, and then something, and then, uh, and then something happened. We we started, uh, you know, we started using satellites, and and realized, um, especially, uh, that uh, the Earth center wasn't where it used to be, <laughs> or where we thought, uh, or where it had been, let's say, or where we thought it had been. So that that location has changed over time, and our realizations have changed over time in some respects, especially on the international frame, to reflect that. But as, as we started to use new technologies, whether it be electronic distance measurement, which allowed us to measure, uh, again, line of sight distances, but over very long distances, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 miles, uh, we were now able to, um, to see uh, disparity in, in our existing control network. So this is what I brought around the, uh, the NAD8386. Um, GPS came out, which again spurred the, the HARN network. So we had to essentially continuously improve our control network um, if for no other reason than to make it usable by those who were doing measurements relative to it. So surveyors needed to be able to go out, use our control, and not find errors in the control network because they are now able to, uh, to measure more accurately than what the control network would support. And then in our last realization, uh, it was just updated, uh, readjusted to keep consistent with course coordinates as course coordinates have changed over time. Along that, with that, we have the relative accuracies and the network accuracies of, uh, of these various uh, datums or realizations of datums. And again, as we can see, as time's moved on, this has gotten much more precise, not necessarily from a local aspect, but from a network accuracy aspect. The, the, our ability to measure uh, very long distances or relationships over uh, hundreds or even thousands of kilometers to uh, a very very high level of accuracy. So, what do you what do you use in your state or in your in your region? Um, NAD twenty seven may be an answer that folks use, but either through uh, through necessity or through choice. Um, for sure, many people use NAD eighty three latitude longitude or state plane coordinates. 
But the answer you have to ask, or I have to ask, is which one? Um, and as you saw in the last slide, we've had many, many different realizations, some in some locations more than others, but many different realizations of NAD83, none of which are equal to the others. Um, and we'll see a little bit later on in this presentation um, an example of, of this. But from a metadata aspect, it's, it's increasingly important, um, again, and hopefully as we'll see, increasingly important to to, to capture this information in as much detail with your data. Um, simple fact is, is that if you don't know what you have, you don't know what to do with it, or you don't know how to transform it into a new coordinate system, should that be your, your, uh, your desire. So this information, again, is very, very important from a metadata aspect. Uh, we can argue the fact whether or not folks are working in WGS84. I, I hear it often that they are. I usually question if that's truly the case. But even if it were, again, which realization or which actual datum of WGS84 are we dealing with? And, and we're looking at differences here in WGS84 uh, realizations of, uh, of upwards of, of two meters. So should someone truly be working in WGS84, it's not adequate just to, to say that you're a reference to WGS84. You need to include which GPS week uh, or which, which realization WGS84 uh, you're actually using. And the same would fall true with the international frames, uh, the international terrestrial reference frame. There have been a number of different ones, obviously, over time, as well as the international GNSS frame. So, uh, you know, NAD83 it, it in itself it is not uh, a good descriptor of what your coordinates are tied to necessarily. Um, again, for the internet, for all the work that we do at NGS, the international frame it really is our starting point. The fact that uh, our velocities are in the international frame. The uh, the orbits of the satellites are in the international frame. So certainly that's where we need to begin our our um, our computations and our references. Um, this just gives you an idea of of what the North American plate looks like, um, or part of the North American plate anyway looks like relative to an international frame. You can see this very nice systematic uh, rotation of the North American plate. Um, i.e. plate tectonics um, at the scale of uh, maybe two and a half or so centimeters per year. Um, so that's how much your coordinates are changing on a yearly basis in, within the international frame. Um, California is doing something a little bit different, uh, which would make sense since that's over on the Pacific plate. Um, but we can also see that we've got a little bit of vertical motion taking place um, as well, up in the up in the northeast, and if if this map were a little bit larger, showing Canada, Hudson Bay, you'd see uh, a much more dramatic um, uplift, and and that's the fact that um, you know 10,000 or so years ago, we were covered with a couple of miles of ice, which compressed the Earth's crust, the the uh, ice melted off, the crust begins to rebound, and and even today it's still rebounding, maybe not significantly, but it's rebounding at you know a rate of maybe a half millimeter or a millimeter per year. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but over the over a, a lifetime of uh, of geodetic leveling through an area where you might have have levels that were done 60, 70, 80 years ago, that millimeter per year certainly uh, has a, the possibility of showing up in your work. So a simplified uh, cartoon of what the difference between ITRF and and NAD83 is, um, and today. Our separation is about at the uh, about two meters, 2.2 meters. So if we look at um, the original realization of NAD83, was in fact the same as where the international frame was. Um, and over time, we've got a better realization of the Earth center mass, which, which is the origin for the international frame. And that origin has moved as we have a better understanding of where that uh, where that location is. The, the zero point for the, for the datum has moved. We have chosen to leave the origin um, uh, for NAD83 in its original location where we understood it to be in 1986. Uh, the reason for this uh, is, our reasons are, are numerous, but um, if, if for no other reason that if, if we were to change, if we went back and looked, remember how many WGS-84s there were, if we, if we were to do that, 
um, if we were to make those changes as they did in the international frame, then we would have all those different new realizations. Okay. And in the early days, these changes in the international frame were on the order of you know decimeter or more per uh, per iteration. Um, whereas today, those iterations are much are down in the centimeter or even sub centimeter range. So the international frames become much more stable. Um, and now might be a good time for us to consider moving to something along the lines of an international frame for our terrestrial reference frames in the United States. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So history of our vertical datums in the United States. Um, we obviously have, we have datums that go back prior to 29, but 29 is probably the earliest that most are familiar with. Um, it was defined by holding, the, holding uh, 26 tide gauges fixed. Um, across the country and in Canada. And uh, not all of those tide gauges were at a single uh, or at the same tidal epoch. Um, and we also didn't account for local mean sea level variations. Um, surveyors out there who work along the coast are probably very familiar with the fact that, that a, a, a tide gauge in one location is not the same as a tide gauge three or four miles up the coast. Uh, tide, uh, local tidal datums are, are are just that, they're very local in nature, um, and they're really only uh, valid uh, within a short distance of where that tide gauge is. So by, ho by holding those, those 26 tide gauges to zero and constraining our leveling to that, uh, we forced, essentially, we forced error into our leveling across the country uh, by, by constraining these non-zero points relative to each other. So this is what NGVD 29 looks like. Um, that's where our tide gauges were held fixed. Okay. So in 1991, we updated to the North American vertical datum of 1988. Okay, you can see here what the definition is. I'm not going to read through that. And NAVD 88 is realized by over 500,000 geodetic marks, 500,000 benchmarks physically set in the ground. Um, and that's one thing I think everybody needs to contemplate for a moment is is how do you tie to your vertical datum and the only way to truly tie to that vertical datum is to go and set up a piece of equipment whether it be a uh, whether it be a, a survey rod whether it be a GPS receiver whatever it might be you need to physically set up or and go touch a piece of brass you have to set up on a benchmark to actually tie to NAVD 88 okay more on that in a moment as well so uh, the one thing that, as you can see, um, I guess you can't see here, but what we did do for NAVD8 was rather than holding multiple points fixed, we held one point fixed. We held one benchmark, um, at, which was that point Rimouski, uh, as you can see, it was up in Canada at the uh, mouth of the St. Lawrence. Uh, we held that one point fixed and ran a minimally constrained adjustment of all of our leveling across the country. What that did uh, was eliminated that um, local mean sea level variation problem that we had in, in 29, but it also opened up the possibility for us to have a buildup of error across the country uh, because we weren't constraining multiple points to control the error. The other issue um, that, that sort of came out of NAVD88 was that the zero surface was actually, mm, it wasn't, it wasn't, in the best of locate, or I'll say, it wasn't as close to sea level as what we probably could have put it at. Um, and a big part of the reason there was that uh, it, if we had put it where zero truly was, it would have forced at that time USGS to redraw uh, most of its USGS quad sheets, um, redraw the contours, uh, which would have been a, a huge expense. Um, and a financial undertaking for them. So um, part of the reason for, for the zero surface that we chose at the time was financial rather than scientific. Uh, I think folk, most folks have seen this, this little cartoon. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but again, this just shows the relationship. Um, if we want to get a vertical or get an orthometric height relative to NAVD88 <clears throat> by using GPS, uh, we would be, we would be getting our GPS-derived ellipsoid height using uh, a particular geoid model, um, differencing those, and then coming up with the orthometric height within, with, uh, relative to NAVD88. Okay. So that's another way that we <clears throat> currently 
um, establish NAVD88 or estimate NAVD88 heights. So as good as NAVD88 and NAVD83 are, there are some, some problems. Um, one, as was pointed out, is NAD83 is not as geocentric as it should be, right? It's about two meters off, 2.2 meters, okay? We don't see that today, right? If, if, if you're out with a fairly inexpensive handheld, uh, you know, recreational grade receiver, and you're getting a position, autonomous position, even a WAS uh, corrected position in the field, you're probably getting a position to about that two meter range. So uh, it's, you're, in, you're in the noise, okay? It won't be too many years from now, but what you'll be able to go out with a very inexpensive receiver. You'll collect. You'll be collecting data from sat from GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, Baidu, uh, you name it. Right. You walk outside, have 40, 50, 60 satellites um, on your screen, and it won't. It wouldn't be unlikely that you'd be able to get an autonomous position to something at the decimeter or maybe even sub decimeter level. At that point in time, that two meters uh, is glaring. It shows up big time. All right, NAVD88 is realized by passive control marks. Remember, if you want to tie to NAVD88, you have to go touch a benchmark. Those benchmarks um, haven't been re-leveled in a long time. Uh, they may not be there anymore due to road construction or uh, you know other other. Um, type of uh, destructive forces, right? Whether it be, you know, storms or floods. Um, and those marks may be in an environment that it, that's moving, either either through, um, you know, through somebody hitting it with a bulldozer or through subsidence or uplift or, uh, or horizontal motion, uh, like slow moving landslides. So the fact that these marks um, could be in a, in a moving environment um, doesn't bode well for their effectiveness as a control point, something that you're you're holding as fixed over everything else. Okay, so you know, in a nutshell, here's some of the things that we know about NAVD88 today. Okay, we know that there's about a half meter bias in the zero surface that we chose for NAVD88, and we also know that there's about a one meter tilt across the country. Um, in the NAVD88 surface, in part because of the unconstrained uh, buildup of error that we had when we did the computations. Uh, there's some other contributing factors to that, but a big part of that was the unconstrained leveling. So what's our plan to deal with this? Okay, so um, in 2008, we first came out with a, with a 10-year plan, which was later updated in 2013. Um, and the, the big takeaway here that we're, there's a lot of information in there, and I encourage folks to uh, to breeze through that, or at least look at the executive summary, maybe. Um, but the the biggest uh, thing that we're looking at is is a replacement of of NAD83 and NAVD88, okay, uh, providing centimeter level access to uh, all coordinates, both uh, geometric and uh, vertical, or what we're now describing as geopotential. So about a couple of years ago, uh, we came up with uh, these uh, scientific decisions. So we've put a document out called a Blueprint for 2022 Part 1, which deals with the geometric uh, datums. Um, we're looking to uh, define or have defined four plate-fixed terrestrial reference frames. We've defined what that means, provided the mathematical equations between the international frames and our new uh, our new terrestrial reference frames, uh, develop plate, plate rotation models uh, for each of the uh, plates. Um, this is the biggest thing right here is, is what we're, our, our, primary, um, our primary product out of, out of this or out of this approach is to compute coordinates at the survey epoch. Um, the one thing that we can do is tell you if you're collecting GPS data and data is being processed, is we can tell you where you are today. We can guess where you were yesterday and we can extrapolate where you will be tomorrow. But the only thing we can truly tell you is where you are at the time you do the observations. Um, after that, we have to look, take into account things like velocities um, of, of the plate and or um, intraframe velocities. Again, so interframe velocities. 
All right, use that to be able to comp uh, compare the coordinates surveyed at different epochs. So what do we call this? So we have the old, which is NAD 83 2011 uh, for, uh, for, the, uh, for the North American plate, uh, Pacific, <clears throat> excuse me, Pacific plate and the Marianas plate. Um, we're actually adding a new uh, plate model, that's the Caribbean plate. So we can see in, um, in CONUS, we're looking at, um, well, not just CONUS, but uh, Alaska and, as well, is uh, the North American Terrestrial Reference Frame of 2022, NATREF 2022. So that's what replaces um, NAD 83. So NATREF, uh, CATREF for the Caribbean, PATREF, and MATREF. So these are the names of the four plate models, um, fixed plate models that we'll have for the new terrestrial reference frames. Our blueprint for part two is a geopotential, which is our, our vertical reference frame uh, based on a three-dimensional geopotential model. Okay, so uh, I don't have a lot of information in this presentation on this, but uh, the takeaway here is that um, basing our vertical datum on physical marks in the ground is not maintainable. Um, they move, they get destroyed, um, and even 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 creating our current hybrid geoid models, for instance, geoid 12b, uh, that that model relies on the fact that we're doing GPS on benchmarks. So if the benchmarks cease to exist or they become or they're unstable, um, then it's very difficult for us to create those types of models. So we're moving into something that's purely a gravimetric model, um, and the basis of our new uh, new vertical frame will be uh, a GPS or GNSS derived ellipsoid height along with a gravimetric model. That's gonna produce our new, uh, our new geopotential or our new potential uh, heights. Uh, it's gonna contain something called GravD data. I'll have just one slide on that. This indicates what that's about. Any high, high resolution geoid deflections of vertical, <clears throat> all part of this system. Time dependencies. The other thing, as as I mentioned on my one of my first few slides, is 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 that it's not just the math, it's not just the models, but how these models are changing over time. So if the gravity field is changing, we need to be able to determine if it is moving and how much it's moving, and does it affect our ability to um, to uh, determine heights? You know, these can be certainly can be impacted by deglaciation, sea level rise, earthquakes, anything that has the ability of redistributing large amounts of mass over the over the surface of the Earth. So the names we have uh, most are familiar with NAVD88. We have uh, some normal orthometric datums that are out on the islands, right? Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, America Samoa, Northern Marianas, Guam. Okay, all of those are are uh, interests of of the U.S. They all have a vertical datum. Um, all of those are really tied to a, a local tidal system as opposed to NAVD88. International Great Lakes datum, uh, the gravity system, geoid undulations, deflections of the vertical. Everything you see on the left is replaced by those two right there. So the North American Pacific Geopotential datum of 2022. So that's our new, that's the replacement for NAVD 88. Um, and it will include geoid 2022. So in, uh, you know, in, um, to, to simply phrase it, um, in the future, uh, in 2022, what we'll do, if you need a height um, in the new datum, you would take GPS equipment out, you would establish an ellipsoid height relative to the North American terrestrial reference frame of 2022. You would then introduce the geoid 22, uh, yeah, you would inter, uh, introduce geoid 2022, and that would give you the North American Pacific geopotential datum of 2022, okay, so NAP GD 2022. So no more going out to utilize a benchmark as a primary access to the new datum. It'll be GPS based, or GNSS based, I should say. Okay, so again, why replace these datums, right? Access, it's easier to find the sky as long as you're not working in the woods, okay? Or, or, or maybe in, in an urban canyon. Uh, it's easier to find the sky than an than a old benchmark, okay? It's easier to trust the data that we get from satellites now 
um, than it is to trust that old benchmark, right? We don't know if it's moved um, since it was first leveled. And the reality is too, is that, is that uh, from a global standpoint, uh, this is really is the direction that everybody um, is moving in. Um, so it, it makes sense for us to move along with them. So for folks who do GPS, I think everybody's fairly confident um, that that we can that we can, and if we if we can't quite today, we will by 2022 be able to very reliably produce centimeter level ellipsoid heights, um, uh, you know, through uh, through GPS or GNS observations. But that means then that we really need to to find this this high precision geoid model, since that's half of our equation, right? Uh, ellipsoid height minus the geoid height that gives us our orthometric height. This is the program that's going to allow us to do that, gravity for the redefinition of the American vertical datum. Um, it's essentially, it's, uh, it, it's a program whereby we are flying airborne gravimetry across uh, the entire country, the Pacific, uh, the Virgin Islands, the Caribbean, um, all the areas that we are interested in, and coming up with a very high resolution and highly accurate gravimetric geoid. Uh, so accessing the datums in the future, again, primary access will be through GNSS observations. Secondarily, you could still use passive control marks, okay, benchmarks on the ground, um, and provide uh, or and convert that, uh, that NAD, uh, NAVD88 height, you could convert that height um, to the NAPGD2022 by using uh, an updated vertical transformation model, which NGS will be providing. Um, today, that's uh, VertCon to go from 29 to 88 and, and vice versa. Um, think of a, a new improved version of VertCon essentially that would allow us to incorporate the NAPGD 2022 heights. Okay. Why does all this stuff matter, right? Why, why are we getting, our, you know, getting <laughs> all worked up about this, okay? And, and the, rea the reality is, is that locations really matter, right? Uh, you know, it, it, Maybe, you know, years ago, maybe, uh, you know, we, we didn't care um, so much, even sometimes in, in the survey world, right, because all we cared about was was maybe how far uh, this property corner was from that property corner or, um, you know, so your coordinate system could be, could be uh, assumed almost as long as everything fit together relatively. Let's not so much the situation today, right? I mean, we still are concerned with relative accuracies. But we're also very concerned with an absolute accuracy. You know, where where is this power line? Where is that fiber optic cable? Um, is is a meter good enough? Is is a half a meter good enough? Is a decimeter good enough? You know, what, what why is it important? Okay, and and the reality is is that we really do care uh, with a high level of precision or an accuracy where where our uh, infrastructure is today, right? So, so what does, so if I say my project's tied to NAD83, what does it imply, okay? Well, it implies that, um, that the coordinates I'm using um, as control were determined by the methods that you see on the screen, okay? That's what NAD83 is, the original NAD83. So, you know, think about that for a minute and say, okay, when, when you go out and you do a really precise survey tied to the, the national uh, continuously operating GPS reference stations and you call it NAD83, you're really doing that a disservice. Those coordinates you're getting are, are much better than that and, and they imply, uh, you know, it re really require a better descriptor, NAD83 2011, for instance. All right, what if you're using, oops, sorry. Uh, what if you're using hard marks? Well, hard marks really were, um, you know, were, were NAD83 points that got GPS work done on them, and then we readjusted uh, that old network to it. So is it better? Yes, um, but again, it's not. It's not the same. So it's really important, I think, for us to to, to think about, uh, you know, each of these different realizations of NAD83. Has a an implied level of accuracy and also an implied method for how those positions were determined. So 
here's just a little example that shows that. Here's a here's a point. Uh, it's in New Jersey, and we can see down at the bottom of the screen on the left. Here is every coordinate value that we've ever computed for this mark. Okay, and we can see that uh, the it goes from um, NAD 27, which I don't have plotted on the screen, but we look at all of the different realizations of NAD 83. So it's NAD 386, NAD 391, NAD 392, NAD 396, 2007, um, and finally the 2011 position, which is published up here at the top um, under current survey control. So on our screen on the right, that's what we're looking at. So at the bottom, is the NAD8386 position, and then we can see here's the 1991 position, the 92, the 2007, and the, and the 96. So we can see that between these, there's a spread of about six decimeters um, from the original position within the NAD8386 to, um, oh, let's say, you know, the NAD8321011, um, and most then and the more current uh, more current realizations so if I did a survey relative to today's coordinate frame NAD 83 2011 and I called it NAD 83 and I would imply that that means 86 without knowing any better um, then you know what we can see is it is it we're sort of misrepresenting the position I also, if I want to do a transformation on that mark, if you tell me that it's NAD8386, I don't know which one of those it is, do we? Right? So, so for me to try to apply a transformation without truly knowing what the basis of the coordinates are uh, would sort of be a fool's errand. Okay? But with having good metadata and knowing what, we're, knowing what you're starting with, then it's very easy using good transformations. This is NGS's uh, NCAT transformation. Um, it's very easy for us then to 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 do uh, very good transformations and represent those coordinates um, in a number of different frames and and maintain quite a bit of the accuracy associated with the control itself. So we can see that you know most of those points fall very very close to truth. And even the oldest point, the oldest, the NAD8386 position is only a couple centimeters away uh, when using the proper transformations. Okay, but again, using the right transformation really requires that you understand where that data came from and what it's truly tied to. Right, so before you start doing transformations, um, you know, what do we have to ask ourselves, right? These are what you should ask yourself. You know, what's, what's the accuracy? What's it tied to? How do I know what it's tied to? Okay, uh, which transformation do I use? What if there's a number of different transformations to choose from? Which one's gonna give me the best results? Okay, are you sure you really wanna do this? All right, so these are all questions uh, that we need to ask. The most important thing here is to, is really is to listen to your data, okay? If, if you can record good metadata, um, then you're not gonna run into those problems, right? So make sure you have the datum, the epic, the source. Um, I like to include how that was determined. Was it through through traverse work? Was it through LIDAR? Was it through genetic leveling? Was it through GPS observations tied to cores? Um, those methods imply a certain level of, of accuracy potentially as well. Okay, so what can you do now, right? Start using the newest realizations, right? Move from NGV 29 to 88 if you can. This will help you to get ready for what's coming in the future, okay? We have a number of, bunch of information on our website that deals with this, and I encourage folks to take a look at that. The last part of this equation um, is here in the States, what we refer to as state plane. Uh, we have a number of different, uh, we have a, a, a website and sub and subsites uh, dedicated to, um, dedicated to uh, to uh, the new state plane coordinate system for 2022. Okay, a number of documents that we can go through, and I'm just going to jump here. Uh, you can download, if, we've, if we have a preliminary design for, uh, for zones for your state, um, those are available. Not every state is available yet. We're currently working on those. 
we have documents that came out with some de and some some deadlines. So for those in in the states, these are um, our, our deadlines where NGS is going to be computing um, computing uh, new new state plane coordinate zones or creating new coordinate zones, and we're looking for input from the user community. So there's some guidelines there for that. Uh, the main thing is is that uh, the same uh, projection types that were used in 83 and 27 will also be used in uh, in 2022. Um, I'm not going to go through all this, but the biggest the biggest um, change is going to be that the um, is that the zones are going to be designed to reduce distortion at the ground. Um, and what I mean by that, let me jump ahead, is this is what we look at when we look at 27 and 83, okay? So you've got a zone, uh, uh, a state plane that's, I say, secant, at, um, so it touches the ellipsoid at two locations. So in this case, see, so in this case, we're, we're minimizing distortion uh, at the ellipsoid. Okay, so as you can see, up at the ground, up at the terrain surface, that's quite a bit uh, more distortion, right? We can see that the, the horizontal ground distance is significantly less than the plane distance. So what if we move that projection um, up, to up toward the topographic surface? Okay, we can see now that our grid distance would be very similar to a ground distance, okay? And in fact, at one point, it would in fact be the same right, where it's touching the terrain. But what if we did something even more creative? What if we, what if we change that projection axis so that now we have multiple points, okay? And the one thing to take away here is that, is that folks will say, well, what's, what, what height are you using to design these, to design these, new, these new zones or these new, um, new systems and, and there isn't a height. As you can see, the heights above the ellipsoids are different because we're because we've changed that projection axis. Okay, so we aren't using a height. Height is part of the equation, uh, but it's not a defining factor of these new zones. Okay. So again, we have a lot of information and this is again, this is a, a topic that can be discussed at great length. We don't have time to do that today. Okay. So Hopefully, I've thrown a whole lot at you really quick, <laughs> uh, and hopefully, it has uh, uh, spurred some some questions and uh, given you some things to look into further on your own. Um, certainly, feel free to get in touch with myself or um, or any of the regional advisors uh, that were on the map, or certainly uh, other folks at NGS. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it back to you guys over at Blue Marble. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, lots of questions, as you you uh, said. Uh, we will not have a chance to go through all of them. We will forward these to you, so you'll you can follow up individually. Uh, lots of comments as well. Very favorable comments. Uh, some people asking once again if this presentation is going to be available. It's great training for uh, you know understanding data so we will be posting this so uh, Dan thank you very much for providing this really uh, excellent resource a few questions I will quickly ask you while we have you on the line um, given sure. our global audience today we have folks here obviously from all over the world very first question came in was specific to Europe what about Europe and its coordinates any change coming there and we had another question along the same lines what are the consequences of this or the repercussions outside of North America anything you can speak to in that regard uh, no, I'm not a huge player on the, on the international stage, so I'm not sure what's uh, what's going on. I do know, um, I do know that both Canada um, and uh, I believe Mexico, but Canada for sure is is really headed the same direction uh, that we are. Matter of fact, we're we're working collaboratively with both. Uh, Mexico and Canada, but um, in the year on the European side, I, I'm not quite sure uh, where they stand. So something they should probably ask of their of their local authorities to get some more detail. Uh, you know, maybe inspired by what's happening over here in the North American side. Um, question as well about um, has the organization has NGS been working with, obviously. Uh, you know, folks like ourselves, perhaps, manufacturers of software and hardware that, to smooth this transition. Obviously, this is coming up a lot. You know, it's going to be here before we know it. Uh, any work being done from your organization to make sure that that happens in a smooth way? Yes, we have been working um, last year uh, in particular. We hosted a, um, a industry day workshop where we invited uh, a number of, of uh, manufacturers, software vendors, uh, et cetera, 
uh, to come in and 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 if you know we provided information to them said this is this is what we're doing uh, what what are your concerns um, so we're asking you know we were asking for input from the user community or from the, the vendor community to say what do you need when do you need it how do you need it how are we going to make this uh, as you said um, an easy transition for you and your customers yeah, and it's something that certainly we're going to be aware of, and we, we will be uh, educating people like you are, and certainly it ties in with with the uh, with our applications, with the geographic calculator, especially. An interesting question, uh, Dan, as well. I'll just throw this one out as well. Uh, this is from early in your presentation. Um, someone's asking, is there, are there any good examples of catastrophic failures that have arisen from different organizations collaborating and not utilizing the same datums? That's that's something that I've been theorized, but I've no. A tangible proof of but do you have any examples are you aware of anything that has happened in that regard um, well I, I don't know that I could say uh, a cataclysmic pro, uh, be, because of uh, because of using different frames although I know that those things happen on minor scales all the time uh, but one that a similar thing that comes to mind is is the uh, the elevation system of elevations um, that were being used down in southern Louisiana um, for uh, for you know for for barriers from from flooding and the fact that you know that those those systems were designed to be at a particular elevation to to protect infrastructure from from the ocean uh, but the fact that they were in a subsidence zone, didn't accurately reflect their true height. So again, the, the, the systems that we're moving to um, hopefully are, are, will, will, be, um, will be much better at, uh, at handling those types of situations where uh, you're not tying to a benchmark that's physically moving, thereby you creating an erroneous height. You're tying to, to, to a system that is that is external to the ground that you're working on. Right, right, right. Uh, just, just one final point or one uh, follow up to somebody who tried to. I think they tried to click on the link on your presentation, and that's obviously not an active link. That's in his slide presentation. Uh, we will uh, be posting this. Um, uh, people are asking about the slides themselves. We'll probably be posting that as well as a video uh, later in the week. So uh, fantastic presentation, Dan. Thank you so much for, for your time, and thank you for uh, educating us and, and enlightening us about uh, uh, the coming changes that, again, we should all be aware of.